How is kingship shown in Macbeth? Analysis and key quotations. Shakespeare presents kingship in two different ways. He uses King Duncan and Malcolm to show us what honourable, respected, legitimate kingship looks like. Shakespeare then uses Macbeth to show us what a tyrannical, violent and illegitimate king looks like. It shows us the dangers of what happens to kingship if you lead by personal ambition rather than by a sense of duty and responsibility to your people. King Duncan is presented as a just ruler who is respected by his subjects. However, he's also shown to be quite ignorant and too trusting. King Duncan learns that the first pain of Cordor was a traitor and orders his execution. This is significant because it shows us that he can have elements of being a strong leader and acts as a warning not only to the other characters in the play, but to the audience what will happen if you try to overthrow a king. After the execution of the Fane of Cordor, King Duncan reflects and says, there is no art to find in my construction in the face. He is the gentleman whom I built an absolute trust. Basically saying that the Fane of Cordor was two-faced. What he was showing, expressing on his face, wasn't really what he was feeling inside in his heart. Dramatic irony is used here because as soon as he says this, Macbeth enters the new Fane of Cordor and Mac Duncan talks about how he owes him, um, is in debt to him. So again, building absolute trust in another Fane of Cordor who is going to actually kill him. King Duncan's blind trust in those who pledge their allegiance to him is his downfall and shows him to be a weak king because ultimately it leads to his death. Macbeth is seen as the foil of King Duncan and shows us what happens when you lead with personal ambition rather than the interest of your subjects. In Act 1, Scene 7, during the soliloquy, Macbeth is conflicted about whether to kill Duncan or not. He is aware that he is a good and humble king and doesn't have any actual reason to kill him but his personal ambition. Macbeth says, I have no spur to prick the side of my intent, but vaulted ambition overleaps itself. So he literally says, I have no reason to do this, but my ambition makes me want to do this. Macbeth's overriding ambition leads to him committing regicide, and this only leads to a spiral of more violence and chaos for him to try and keep hold of the power. One of the threats to his power is Banquo and his children, as we obviously he learned at the same time as Macbeth's prophecies that his children will become king. And from what we know, Macbeth cannot produce children because he speaks about his fruitless crown. Having an heir is an important part of kingship because it is something that you can pass down the power down to your children and provide stability for the country. And this was something that actually was happening during the time because Elizabeth I was queen before James I became king and she died without having any children. And therefore, James I became king of England and there was a lot of uh, tension because of this. Beth believes that his kingship has no meaning until he secures this. And that means getting rid of Banquo. Now let's talk about Malcolm. In Act 1, Scene 4, Duncan names Malcolm, the Prince of Cumberland, his heir to the throne. This was actually quite unusual at the time because it was actually the Thanes who elected the next king. Um, so for Duncan to do this shows actually uh, an element of power and authority because he's breaking tradition in order to get what he wants. This is one moment where Macbeth could be seen as royalist propaganda. So shortly after James I became King of England, he became the patron or sponsor of Shakespeare's Theatre Company and the name actually changed to the King's Men. Um, so obviously, if he's your new patron, your new sponsor, you're going to have to produce plays that are going to flatter the King. So this can explain why Shakespeare presents Duncan, Malcolm and Banquo, who was thought to be a descendant of James I, in such a positive light. So while Malcolm shows qualities of his father, he shows that he's more aware of the deception that surrounds them and flees to England. So while it could also be seen as a weakness that he's decided to just run away, it could also be quite sensible because he can go to England and uh, gather allies in order to then come back to Scotland. Malcolm actually uses deception himself in Act 4, Scene 3 to test Macduff's loyalty and make sure that he's not just an agent of Macbeth. He states that under his kingship, Black Macbeth will seem as pure as snow. He starts to list all the bad qualities that he has, such as startless avarice and lust and desire. And he says that if he became king, he would cut off nobles from their land and desire his jewels. After Macduff pretty much says that he's a disgrace to his family, Malcolm then reveals that he wasn't being serious and it was all a joke and says that uh, he did it to try and tr prove Macduff it was loyal to him. Um, again, showing us the difference between uh, Duncan and him in the fact that he is so distrusting because of everything that's happened, he needs people to prove themselves to him rather than just listen to their words like his father did.
So Malcolm returns to Scotland, Macduff kills Macbeth and the natural order is restored. So in his final speech, Malcolm has words or language that he uses mirrors his father's. Duncan says that he has begun to plant his thanes um, and all those deservers. And here Malcolm says that uh, his royal duties are going to be planted newly with time. So we start to see that he will possibly going to have those good honourable characteristics like his father. Malcolm's future kingship can be questioned. He's already shown signs of being deceptive with testing Macduff, same way we see those signs in Macbeth, and then they all hail him the King of Scotland, similar to what the witches do when they all hail Macbeth. So it shows that he has the qualities to possibly be a bad king, it's just about the path he chooses to tread. Kingship is an important theme in the play and reflects what was happening and the ideas that people had in society at the time. So the divine rights of kings was a concept that was widely accepted by society at the time and this was the belief that the king was closest to God and therefore only answerable to God. As religion was also just as important at the time, it was a system where people um, could not challenge it at all. The monarchy had absolute power. The play looks at what happens when somebody tries to disrupt this natural order and we actually even see this through the description of the weather. In Act 2, Scene 3, after the death of Duncan and Macduff and Lennox arrive at the castle of Macbeth, he describes how the night was unruly, how chimneys were being blown down and how the earth was feverous. Here Shakespeare uses prophetic fallacy to show us that the uh, unsettled incidents that took place in Macbeth's castle is also showing us through the unsettled weather. In the spring of 1606, there were uh, wild storms that killed almost 2,000 people. Um, so although it didn't happen in Scotland, it happened in England, the contemporary audience would have been aware of this. But shortly before this, these storms took place, there was the att uh, attempted assassination of James I uh, with the gunpowder plot. And so there could be that link there that the weather has reflected the fact that somebody tried to uh, commit regicide and kill the king. Shakespeare also used the motif of clothing throughout the play to show us that Macbeth is not the rightful king. In Act 1, Scene 3, when Macbeth is named the Fane of Cawdor, he says, why do you dress me in borrowed robes? Showing us that he doesn't believe that the position is rightfully his and uh, it, it doesn't belong to him. The imagery of clothing is used throughout, particularly in Act 5, Scene 2, when Angus says that Macbeth's titles um, hung loose about him like a giant's robe on a dwarfish thief. The use of the simile here shows us that Macbeth is in a position that is not rightfully his, that he needs to return the borrowed robes. By saying that he's a dwarfish thief, it's shown us that they believe that he's stolen the crown and now it's time to return it to Malcolm. Lastly, Macbeth refers to his kingship throughout the play as the crown. Malcolm refers to it as the throne. Like clothing, a crown can be taken on and off, showing us again he shouldn't be the rightful king. Whereas Malcolm, a throne is permanent and fixed, like his power. So this can be seen as royalist propaganda. Malcolm is seen to be the rightful king. Um, same way in reality, James I wanted to be accepted by society as the rightful king. And um, what happens if you disrupt this natural order, social order? Um, Macbeth gets his head chopped off and Guy Fawkes got hung, drawn and quartered. So... Uh, don't do it, basically. So yeah, kingship done.